in 1964, my old Mongolian teacher who dragged me there, and who not really dragged me, I dragged him. Anyway, I shouldn't say that. I dragged, you know, but who brought me there, uh, left me in care of Dalai Lama. Uh, before he left, he showed up at, uh, at our little quarters there and uh, with the Dalai Lama's physician, this amazing man called Yishi Denden, who had a face like a Garuda bird and with these amazing cheekbones. And the cheekbone line went up to his ears like that. And he just looked like that bird, which is a symbol of medicine, you know, the Garuda bird. And he really looked like that. And he said, you study medicine with this man. The Mongolian did. And I said, what do you mean? I don't want to study medicine. I'm here to meditate or study emptiness and retain enlightenment. He said, oh, that's some other time. <laughs> he said, you study medicine now. You want to understand Tibet, you, understand, you study their medicine. And uh, then it was fascinating, I must say. You know? And I'd been, I, at that point, what was I? I was a dropout senior from Harvard. And so I'd been through you know, Exeter and I suppose all the great education. And I had no idea. I wasn't pre-med, right? But I had no idea what the kidneys did, or the spleen, or the liver. Or, yeah, I know, where even are they? You know, like, you know, like, what are they? You know? Heartbeats, yeah, I know that, and there's some lungs up here, you know. I was smoking Golwaz, you know. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, you know, you start to realize, you know, you, what, what your body is up to, you know. It's an amazing experience. Okay, um, there's enough about me. Okay, in Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pradnya Paramita Hridaya, let's go, everybody. In Tibetan, Chanden Dema Shira Pachin Jingbo. In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion, the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagurha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Sharadatiputra thus, Shariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes are you really realize to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter. Neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mentioned consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on, up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shariputra, as the Bodhisattva, without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. Her spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth, the transcendent wisdom mantra as follows, Tadyata, 
Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Sariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the Blessed Lord had spoken thus, the Venerable Sharadatiputra, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, Everyone in that audience and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoiced and all applauded what the Buddha said. <laughs> so I heard that this morning you were brilliantly reciting the same Prajnaparamita Sutra, the shorter version, which is the syllable ah, and you were doing it in a wonderful learning how to help a dying person with that, that's really great. Because that is the shortest of the 18 different versions of the Prajnaparamita. The shortest is ah. That's all it is. Now, does anybody have any question so far in the, <coughs> in the whole event that we're doing here? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm smothering this. Does anybody have any question? The initially that you know that has been building up about these topics, you know, you know, not about how old is the Dalai Lama or something, <laughs> how, about this topic. Any question? What I thought I would do this afternoon in this session. Oh yes, yes. Yes, I don't know when it was announced in the Bible Club. All of these that the Becky Stepping Hour and committing suicide. There was a can, I couldn't quite. Did you want to know about the Tibetan, the Tibetan lamas and monks and the Tibetan what? The monks and nuns who are committing suicide. Oh, the monks who are committing suicide. Yeah, right. Oh, they're not well. I'm not only monks, also lay people, old and young. Exactly. Very upsetting, to me and Dalai Lama, and he said it when it first started. He said, "Oh, that's terrible. It won't be effective." as well. And, uh, and then the Chinese are trying to act like somehow Dalai Lama is making them do it, which is absolutely the opposite of the case. And um, so it's a tricky thing. He, he can't really make a big statement. He says that uh, he doesn't approve of it as a policy. And if anybody asked him, who said, no, I'm going to go out and burn myself today as, a, as an offering to the Buddhas, and in order to sort of call attention to the Tibetan plight and so on, <coughs> uh, he would say, absolutely not. You should be offering every day for your long human life your ignorance and your greed and your hatred and many things, and due to the Buddhas, and you should be working using your human intelligence to become a Buddha, and if your Chinese are making you suffer, you should be using that suffering to develop yourself and so forth. And by no means should you cut your body short, your life short like this, and do this to yourself. And it is not effective, even helping or calling attention is not going to have any effect. So, but, if they asked him ahead of time. But then afterwards, they are kind of heroes in the Buddhist sense, and he doesn't feel he should condemn them. So he's kind of stuck there, you know. He, at least he does respond to the Chinese. He says, "Please come. You can go through all my emails. You can go through everything in every office here, and there's nobody encouraging them to do this. Uh, this is something that may have started. They may have recently. Well, no, that guy. There was a guy in Dharamsala who was a cook. He had been a monk. He then uh, was in the Indian military, in the Tibetan Defense Force. That that." Um, tried to help poor Nehru when China invaded Arunachal Pradesh, the northeast frontier area, in 1962. And the Indians couldn't struggle with them at that altitude. They hadn't trained up there. And then the Tibetans formed a brigade to try to defend India, their sort of new mother country. 
and he had served in that. And then he was actually was working as a cook in Dharamsala after having gotten out of Indian military service. And he was down in Delhi with some people who were doing a fast unto death, they were saying, to protest you know, the visit of Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin. I, don't I think Jiang Zemin and in, in India. And then the Indians dragged them away and hooked them up, IV'd them you know, to, so they wouldn't die. And then while they were dragging them away, this one guy who had joined that fast, he lit himself on fire. And this was 1997, so it was Jiang Zemin's time. And Dalai Lama was really upset about it, and he went to the, all the way, he was coming to America, actually, so I saw him right after that. And he came to Delhi, and he went to the hospital where the guy was all like a mummy, all bandaged up, not quite dead yet, but he did die. And uh, the Dalai Lama whispered into his ear, okay, you know, you made this statement, I wish you hadn't, but you did, that's your statement, and, but please, do not die with hatred of the Chinese in your heart. That would be really, really terrible, and it would be against everything. And so do not do that. You've done this, and you may die, and you know, think of it, I guess you can think of it as an offering to awaken people to the nature of suffering. Uh, but you're trying to awaken the Chinese just as much as anybody else, and do not die with any tiny scrap of hatred of the Chinese people in your heart. And the guy, the guy, you know, he said there was a perceptible sort of nodding from within, you know, of the mummy, the bandaged mummy there. I saw a photograph. And then he was very, very upset about it, the Dalai Lama, and he was in America. And uh, I saw him at the premiere of Kundun shortly after that. And he was, he was really upset about it because he was saying that the kind of energy, the kind of emotional pitch that people would get to have to do that uh, is similar to a suicide bomber. And he thought if someone, if the Tibetans are doing that now, maybe they'll do suicide bombing, then that will give an excuse for Chinese to be even more genocidal. And it would be terrible, it would be totally against his uh, thing. And he never made that as a public statement, thank goodness, because you never know, Chinese might have done an agent provocateur suicide bombing to blame the Tibetans. And they might have arranged something. And uh, so then, but then we come back to the current 150 people so far who have done this. And um, I defend them, actually. Um, some people attack me on the internet for doing so, but I do defend them. But similarly, I like His Holiness, I can totally agree. If anybody told me, don't do that. Actually, I even, I confess, I lied in Lhasa once in the 90s, or I think in the, maybe the noughts, aughts, whatever you call that decade. And I met some nuns, some activist nuns in Tibet, and who go, go and they pray, long live Dalai Lama, and they wave the flag, and then they get tortured and busted and kicked out of the nunnery if they survive because they put in a Chinese camp for doing that. you know. But they just do it because they just feel overwhelmed and compelled to do it. So I actually lied and I said, His Holiness told me if I met any of you not to do that, to stay in your monastery and study and things will someday improve and then your study will be, you will be a great person and you'll be able to do something and don't waste your life on that. You know, It's not helping anybody and it's just ruining your study and your life and don't let your emotions carry you away like that. And I actually lied. He hadn't told me that. He didn't know I was going to Tibet at that time. But he would agree with me. I actually confessed to him. And he was glad I did. He said, good. He, he praised me for lying. <laughs> to the nuns. And my accent in Tibetan, when I speak Tibetan, is like his. And they get all emotional around me, Tibetans. So I have to be very careful in Tibet because they're being watched all the time, you know, by surveilled all the time. You know. Now, coming back to the current group, um, Basically, I think his only was correct in that original worry he had, that they are people who have become so distressed at the Chinese interference in their culture, the Chinese torture of different great teachers and lamas, and the whole scene that they are doing, which is very, very harsh in Tibet. You have to understand, they are being treated extremely harshly, and it accelerated enormously since 2008 when there was a mainly nonviolent, basically, rebellion in Tibet, 
where they did things like they tore down the Chinese flag, they put up the Tibetan flag. In Lhasa, there was some violence, but I believe that, I personally believe that was staged because that is something they had, that Hu Jintao did when he was party boss in Tibet in the late 80s and declared martial law. He stayed, you know, what they do is they dress up some, some Chinese uh, people or Tibetan agents that they have in their own secret police as monks, and then they have them go out and do some beating or burning or something, and then, they, then there's a mob gathers around them, and then they shoot the mob and stuff. They, the thing they have done before. And so I believe that one because the party boss in Tibet at the beginning of that whole nationwide thing, uh, like something like 215 demonstrations all over Tibet, including areas that are technically outside of the Tibet Autonomous Region, but actually are Tibet, where two thirds of the Tibetans live in the eastern, the four Tibet Autonomous Prefectures of, of four eastern, four western provinces of China and eastern parts of Tibet, which they divide it off and act like it isn't Tibet, but actually it is Tibet. And, um, you know, Kham and Amdo is what the Tibetans call it. So in those, there were all these protests in those regions. But the only violence that people can point to other than Chinese shooting into crowds were the ones in Lhasa. And that Jiang Jingli, who was the party boss at that time, the, the fall before in 2007 when Dalai Lama was given the gold medal in the Congress here in the U.S., that Jiang Jingli said on CNN, he said, I will show you that the Dalai Lama is an evil wolf and a bad person and no good and blah, blah, and the Tibetans are not nice and you think they're great and you are people in the world and you're all wrong and they're evil and bad and blah, blah, blah. He made a big thing how he was going to do something. And that's what he did. He staged a thing where it made, he tried to make Tibetans look like they were beating up some people and things like that. And, uh, and that was played, it was more for the Chinese market. It was played endlessly in the Chinese media to make the Chinese feel Oh, we've done so much for Tibet, and now they're beating us up and burning our shops, and et cetera, et cetera. You know? And the proof that I have is only that A, they've done it before, and B, the Tibetans were pretending to look like Kambas, who are these very tough people in eastern Tibet, but they were doing it in front of cameras. The Kambas, if you go in Lhasa now, there's surveillance cameras on every roof of low buildings. You can go up on the stairs of those low buildings, and you can break those cameras if you're going to do something like that. If Tibetans want to actually have a fight and a revolution, and Kambas are well capable of it, they're not going to do it in front of cameras. I wouldn't, would you? Because then they identify you, and they have you know, software they get from Silicon Valley. You know, it's sold by us, facial recognition software. They're going to find you and beat you up and your family and torture you and kill you, and you'll be executed. So that would, they definitely were not doing that, really doing that. Anyway, that's what sparked this off. And basically then, the people who burned themselves, they are considering that they are making an offering of their body and showing their freedom, actually, because they feel they are caught under genocidal oppression. And somehow, when somebody is coming to kill you, you say, you can't kill me because I'm going to do myself in as a voluntary choice. And I'm going to give my body as, as a prayer that you know, this situation of mutual oppression and mutual you know, master-slave situation that's going on here is not a proper thing for human beings to do. You are not proper being master. I am not proper being a slave. I assert my freedom. I'm going to give up my life. Because actually, the physical life is not the main thing in life, you know, the physical body, you materialist. Marxist, dialectical materialist, Chinese soldiers, and secret police, etc. So it's a very powerful statement, actually. And, it has, it, and the Chinese know that. And their biggest fear, the, the dominators, is not to let this be seen in China. Because actually, in the Buddhist tradition, the, the, the ritual of offering your body in flames is very much more prevalent in Chinese Buddhism, Vietnamese Buddhism, not in Tibetan Buddhism, because those cultures don't have Tantra, where you consider the body to be this sacred temple that if you learn to use the human body, you can accelerate evolution enormously, and therefore you should never damage your body. There's a big thing about that. Not that you, know, you won't be reborn. They don't consider it suicide because they're not killing their self. 
their self is going to be reborn. And basically, on a, out of giving your body, you'll be reborn better in a better body. And maybe you'll be in California instead of Eastern Tibet being beaten up by some Chinese people's armed police. Or you might be born as a Chinese person. And you might be telling the people's arm, daughter of a member of the people's armed police. And when that guy goes home on vacation, you might say, Daddy, why are you beating up the Tibetans? And who's telling you to do that? And what is the point of that, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so that's the thing. And, and therefore, I consider them kind of following the Dalai Lama's injunction against violence and his insistence that Tibetan freedom will be won by nonviolence, which will be the first in history that an international, you know, international struggle will be, have been won by nonviolence. You know, Gandhi, in some sense, won freedom from the British by nonviolence, but that was within a, one country. And also, it was a huge majority of Indian people against the minority of British uh, colonial power. Uh, but, but no one ever tried it you know, in, uh, in an international thing. And a small 6 million Tibetans and 130 million, I mean, 1.3 billion Chinese. It's never been done. But, but Dalai Lama has insisted on doing that. And so these are people who are at a point where, of course, they would have absolutely sacrificed their life and body like any soldier does, a real soldier. You know, they charge machine gun nests and so forth, you know, Sergeant York or whatever, what have you, you know. That's what soldier Iwo Jima, you know, like they charge the, they charge the enemy and they're ready to give their life, you know. And uh, they're at that point where they would have attacked and blown up a police station or done something. Tibetans are very capable of, mech, you know, they're, they're very fierce. They, where they, when they did fight the Chinese in eastern Tibet uh, in the 50s, they, were, they took a, exacted a huge price from much better armed Chinese soldiers. But they were eventually, of course, defeated in numbers and also armament. They were poorly armed. And the Dalai Lama also told them not to do it, so they were not actually sort of licensed or legitimized in doing that, but they just did it to defend themselves. So... Uh, so they are doing what they are at that point of heroism where they could actually, in a normal setting, harm somebody else, but they are not harming anybody else. And they are making this, they're, they're changing the level of the game, actually. And so they are kind of like the heroes of the war of nonviolence, in a way. And of course, I think some of them, unfortunately, were not, were not necessarily yet at a level where they really don't have anger or hatred in their minds. I think maybe some of the monks do, uh, are at that level. But I think some of the lay people, especially the young ones, I don't think they're necessarily at that level. And so unfortunately, it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag for them. It's not as, it's not as perfectly done as, as otherwise. But I don't know if you remember, you do, because you're my age-ish. So you remember the monk in Vietnam who, who gave his body you know, and walked up smiling and talking and then sat down. And I don't know if you ever saw the full film where he smiles even with the flames blazing. He's still smiling. And he, and he walked and talked just before, so he was not doped up. And, he's, and then his body just goes poof like that. And that had such a powerful impact in relation to the, our population and the sense of the, Viet, the injustice of the Vietnam War. So therefore, the Chinese, they shut down all cell phone things. They, go out and confiscate people's phones. And they're desperate not to have that spread in China, especially. And even abroad, but especially in China. They don't want the young people in China to see that. Because it's such a powerful challenge to their fake thing that they are helping the Tibetans, where the Tibetans do that in the, in the hundreds. And the Tibetans say funny things like, one guy in Tunisia, like a fruit seller, he burned himself because he didn't get his like, you know, like sidewalk license to sell his fruit. And then there's all Arab Spring. And we're 150 and counting, and nobody's doing anything. And the British are out there, oh, please come and open a bank in London. You know, they're like behaving like that, the Queen of England. But this is what has been happening. Tibet has been sacrificed to its expediency and the greed of uh, many people. But anyway, never mind. That's what, that's what my answer about all of that. <clears throat> OK? It's very scary. You know? Very frightening, and it's so painful. But it's luckily very quick. You know, you 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 just go out of your nervous system pretty quickly. But it's a searing pain to die by fire.
fire is my worst pain. Actually, when I was a monk, toward the end of my time as a monk, I got blown up in a gas fire. And all my friends were freaked out in 1966. And they were freaked out. They said, you're not going like that Vietnamese monk, are you? <laughs> I said, no, no, it was an accident. <clears throat> but I, my arms were badly burned, and, my, and my, my, my bald, shaved head was badly singed. I got my hands in front of my face in time. And it was a kind of explosion. Anyway, I got to see the pain of that. Really bad. OK. So I thought today we would look at the, OK, is that OK? Do you have any other more question about it? It's very rare in Tibet, but now, you know, in the past, there's almost no example of such a kind of self-sacrifice, even though it's in the Buddhist tradition. But, but the East Asian people more did it than the Tibetans because of the presence of Tantra in Tibet, where your body is such an important vehicle. It's like a mandala for your, high, your super accelerated evolutionary advancement that you don't want to give up your body casually or until the last possible breath. The last possible, ah, you want, to, you want to stay there. And actually, the Tibetan doctor shocked people once. I, then I used to travel with him in America and translate for him a lot. And there was one event at Omega with a big crowd, I think. I think it was Omega, and he shocked people. When somebody said, in one of those cases, you know, turning off the things in a hospital, you know, and someone in a coma, you know, a vegetative state. And they said, well, what do you think about that? And, you know, and he said, the Buddhist answer to that is you keep those pumps going as forever if possible. In other words, as long as possible, because saving life is always good. And you don't know, someone's in a coma as far as being able to communicate outside, but you don't know what's going on in their subtle mind and subtle, super subtle mind and in their chakras and things, and, or in their dream state they may be in, and you don't know it may be very, very valuable and important to them. And he went on like that, which people were very annoyed to hear about. <laughs> but then he said, of course, there's also the pragmatic thing. If it's bankrupting a family, then that would upset the person. If it's so expensive, and if other people are suffering because of that, then th that can overweigh. But you should start with the principle that as long as life is maintained, even if it's a vegetative life, even if the people are telling the brain is gone, don't listen to that if it was affordable, you know, if it was not causing other suffering to other people. So he was willing to compromise, you know, in other words. But he wanted to lay down that basic line, you know. And that is the Buddhist view, you know. Life is so precious. What? What? Yes? Um, my mother was dying. I, I can't hear you. My mother was dying. Yes? Yes? And um, she went into a coma. Yes? Yes. And her doctor said, I would like to up her morphine. Uh huh. So because she was treated in so much pain, and he said, You don't understand what I'm asking you. You know, I think you should save this one for tonight, okay? okay? Because actually, he's an expert in this type of thing, and I am not. I'm just talking about principles. No, he's the one who's been at people's bedside. So please save this story and question for the evening, okay? When we're having more dialogue. Okay. I want to go ahead with Book of the Dead. And, and it should go on, you know, discussing many different types of dying. You know. So basically, if you have your own home coma pump, keep them alive forever, <laughs> possible, even if they smell. <laughs> That's the Buddhist bottom line. That, I'm just giving a principle. I can't answer intelligently specific instance because I don't have the experience. I'm an I'm a ivory tower, like hopeless, like scaredy cat. Dale knows what's going on in the, in the crunch of these events. And so I totally defer to him. And I want to have, have time to help people with the Book of the Dead, OK? Thank you. Please forgive me. OK, so now we're back in this Book of the Dead. Now, uh, it begins with the, with the, there's three betweens in the death and rebirth time. There's what's called. Uh, the death point between, there's the reality between, and there's the existence between. I guess that's how I translate it. No one can ever, yeah, I call it the existence between. The bhava, because that is bhava, the Sanskrit word is bhava. And, but actually, that is like, um, 
Uh, that's before birth. So, but it's at the point of conception. Maybe conception between Baba would be better. I don't know. I never am satisfied with the, that particular moment. It's also one of the 12 links of dependent origination. It's the same word. You know, before birth and then old age and death, which is 11 and 12. The 10th one is this called Bhava, which they, people translate as existence or potential existence or state of something. And I, I never quite like what they translated as. Becoming, oh yeah, the traditional translation in Pali, from Pali, is the becoming. It's like becoming, but nobody really knows what that is, including me. <laughs> but the word doesn't help. OK, so now, preliminaries. And it has starts, oh, Amitabha, boundless light of the truth body, O oh, mild and fierce beatific body, lotus deities, O oh, Padma Sambhava, incarnate savior of beings, I bow to the three bodies in the spiritual mentors. So again, always it begins with a context verse. Remember last time I was making a big fuss about context because it's one of your jobs and one of the things, services of Menla is helping you do context evaluation, examination, and hopefully transformation so that you bit by bit try to free yourself from the uh, common sense, consensual context that we are inflicted by as Americans in our culture and with our education, which is kind of gloomy. And this is like, Amitabha means boundless light. It means that Buddha himself is this boundless light that we are made of, that is all that we're here. We just don't see it as extra light. We have the electric light, the daylight, moonlight. We don't see boundless light because we're made of it. The eyeball that would look is made of it. So in a way, it can't see what it's made of. You know, it's like a, it's because the, the subject and object are the same thing, so it doesn't seem to present itself as an object. And only when the, all of the organs and everything, only there's some, and actually nobody ever realizes the clear light, actually. If I want to say the real clear light, I would be so radical as to say nobody ever realizes it in the sense that when we think we say knows or experiences, we're always thinking of a subject experiencing an object. And therefore, it's an experience that someone who had that got to some sort of threshold and had an idea of seeing some light, they think they possess that experience. And then, then they're caught in the, Zen would say they're caught in the demon ghost cave because they're going to go around thinking they're enlightened. And that would be a problem. That would get them in a problem. I have a terrible saying, and you please must forgive my vulgarity, but it's just a matchless saying. If you go around thinking you're enlightenment, then you're forced to fart Chanel number five. I'm sorry. I have a few laughs. <laughs> but I know a few gurus who have that problem. <laughs> I do. And I haven't, I haven't smelled one yet. <clears throat> so the point is, what happens about the clear light of the void, which is reality, is you melt into it. We could sort of, that's the best we can say, because subject object non duality. It, and therefore, there's no experience of it because you stop experiencing. It's beyond unconsciousness. But it's different from just being unconscious about it or just believing that it's there. It is yet different. So then in another way, you can say realize. You can say experience. But then the person who did shouldn't claim it. As I told a certain person who has made a lot of trouble lately from the Tibetan tradition, going around saying, I can do what I want because I realize emptiness. And this is a guy who never, you know, who, who, you know, he'd never had a decent dose. So he'd never disappeared. So he thought once he disappeared that he was some sort of big deal. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and so it's a sad story. He otherwise had a lot of accomplishment, did a lot of good things, but then he, I own the experience of emptiness. That's ridiculous. And then I asked that guy, who was something of a scholar, supposedly, didn't you ever read in Prajnaparamita? There's no attainment and no non-attainment. Oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> what? Oh, that referred, would that refer to me? I don't think so. Because I realized emptiness. I mean, give me a break. You know, matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. So you're not, if you have space like equipoise because a piece of matter that you're looking at, your nose, 
dissolves under analysis. You can call that realizing the emptiness of the nose, but you just didn't find the nose, actually. That's all. You didn't find emptiness, if you follow me. Because if you, if you want to find emptiness then, and you say, oh, I didn't find my nose, let me find emptiness, then that will also disappear under analysis. And that will be its emptiness, which you can't find. But you can dissolve into it. You are it, you know. You're matter. You know, it's matter. In other words, this fist, this knee, this knee bone, they, are, they can touch each other. I can hit them solidly because they're both emptiness. Okay? But it isn't like if I know the emptiness of the knee, I can just put my hand through the emptiness. No. They are emptiness in touching each other already. Matter itself, the nucleus of the atom is emptiness. The subatomic, if there were an indivisible subatomic part, which Buddha predicted they never will find, and he's been so far, that has been borne out, uh, is, is emptiness. Not this empty space in which it's spinning only. OK, that's, I'm, that's a, I'm making a big fuss about that. I apologize. <laughs> but it helps us melt into that. <laughs> OK. So implementing the practical instructions that teach the art of liberating beings. Those of greatest ability will surely be liberated. If they are not, they should practice the natural liberation through soul transmission in the death point between. I think this is one yoga of Dale. I, actually, I don't call it soul, soul transmission. I don't like that term anymore. I now would call, I call it soul ejection. Just like in a jet airplane, you have an ejection button. Boom! And you will shoot it right, right up out of the, and the canopy of, the, of your F-15 like flies off, and you go up there, and the plane crashes, right? That's, a, that's soul ejection. That's a perfect word. <laughs> soul ejection. So this is a, you practice that, you know, where you, you find your conscious, super subtle consciousness, which is, which is encapsulated in the heart center in a double triangle and all wrapped around in a six-fold knot, they call it. And then, but that starts to unravel when you're dying. And you sort of go align with that. Or your friend who knows how to do it, I believe Dale is an expert at this, you go th and he aligns their consciousness with your consciousness, like sort of picking up a piece of cotton or something like that with a, another piece of cotton. And then you, you go like, Hick! like that. And you imagine that you're driving that up through the crown of the head. And that's really something cool. And you, and, and, but before you do that, actually, there's a very beautiful thing, where, which is one version. There are other versions. You can use Padmasambhava or something. But the one that I know and that I like, Maitreya Buddha, you think of Maitreya Buddha in his Tushita heaven. And then there's this funnel of golden light that comes down from his heart center down to the crown of your head. And it's a little bit bigger than it's a point. So in case the thing bounces in accidentally, <laughs> it catches it like a funnel. And so when you hick it and you go out, you go into that point of light, into that funnel. And then, then the, the tractor beam from the heart of the Buddha draws you up into the Buddha's heart. And then, of course, Buddha's heart is the, is the, is the, then returns you to your heart, which is infinite clear light, right? infinite brilliance. That's a, it's so beautiful, that one. I actually once had a monk die who was a graduate student of mine and was a, a very talented, genius, beautiful monk of the Dalai Lama's monastery. But he had this fibrosis in his lung. And we had many operations in New York. He was a graduate student there, had insurance, and they couldn't fix it. And then he finally died. And then all his fellow graduate students and colleagues and myself, we did that. We did a ritual like that. And, and, but then we used, actually, Dalai Lama sitting on top of his head, his subtle body head, and then uh, on a lotus. you know, And then him going up like that himself. We didn't do sort of poa, but we, we imagined him doing it. And together, and actually a number of us in that ritual at that certain moment, we sort of saw him smiling and actually going up and merging with, uh, with His Holiness. We sort of, a bunch of people saw it and had like a mental, I mean, maybe it was just our fantasy, but we, it was a very similar. Everyone saw it in the same way. And really marvelous. He was so happy, the guy, getting away from his fibrosis. You know, it really was. But he was unhappy because, the, because uh, I told him to be unhappy on the table there when they were intubulating him. And I said, OK, you're leaving. But I'm keeping your notes for your PhD dissertation. 
and I'm going to save your scholarship, which I couldn't do, it, but <laughs> I'd have to pay it myself if he gets reborn. And you have to come back and finish this PhD. So don't think you're getting out of it. <laughs> but he hasn't showed up yet. For, but some lama said he reincarnated as in his brother's family, they say, but we don't know. He hasn't shown up yet anyway. OK, so then, uh, so then there are these things where they give instructions. You know, when signs of death are clearly complete, you should employ the natural liberation through soul, trans soul ejection, soul transmission. If soul transmission succeeds, it is unnecessary to read this book of natural liberation clearly and distinctly, sitting beside the body. But, oh, if it does not succeed, you should read this book of natural liberation clearly and distinctly, sitting beside the body. If the body is gone, then you should sit at the bed or seat of the deceased. You should invoke the power of truth, summon the soul, Visualize the deceased that's sitting in front of you listening and read this book of natural liberation. During that procedure, it would be very disturbing if the loved ones and relatives were to weep and lament. They should be quieted. If the body is still there during the time when the outer breath has ceased, but the inner breath has not, the dead person's teacher, fellow disciple, or trusted and beloved relative or friend should read this book of natural liberation with lips not quite touching the ear of the corpse, that is. And, uh, and then all kind, you know, sort of things about saying these preliminary prayers that are quite nice and that, and that, and uh, Now, recognition of the clear, the first important instruction, you give recognition of the clear light, that is the luminosity, what Leo calls in the death point between. The clear light is an indescribable transparency, a light that is omnidirectionally illuminating yet beyond the brightness of sun or moon, and also beyond dimness or darkness. I should also say or shadow. The text uses the terminology of betweens in a somewhat confusing way. Well, I don't want to do that so much. So then you say, this, there's a lot of good instruction here, though. Now, hey, noble one, you say, to the corpse that's in front of you, you named so-and-so. Now the time has come for you to seek the way. Just as your breath stops, the objective clear light of the first between will dawn, as previously described to you by your teacher, which is what your, your, your dying hospice attendant has been doing, doing during your time lying there waiting to die and preparing you. So as previously described to you, what this clear light will look like. Your outer breath stops, and you experience reality stark and void like space. Your immaculate naked awareness, dawning clear and void without horizon or center. At that instant, you yourself must recognize it as yourself. You must stay with that experience. I will describe it again to you at that moment. So here is where, you know, the I have it that we have, the ha ahamkara, the Sanskrit, or dagzin in Tibetan, the self-habit or I-habit. Rather than just sort of suspend it completely and I don't think of anything, you should transfer it when you feel yourself slipping away from consciousness and your sense of boundariedness and slipping into some sort of vast space in a way, becoming the vast space. Actually, there was a, I love The Matrix, the film. I don't know if you remember. But in The Matrix, when, when Neo bravely, admirably, takes the red pill from Morpheus, and then at one point, he's looking at himself in the mirror, and then he touches the mirror. And then the mirror surface comes on his finger, and he's like looking at it, then it comes up his arm, <laughs> and then he starts writhing. Because the mirror is, is absorbing him, actually, right? Because it's swallowing back his matrix projected illusory image. And then they are tracing and trying to find where the actual body is in the, in the, in the test tube, remember? They, you know, the submarine people are. But he's having an experience of being absorbed into something. And he's like resisting it. So that, that's how it could feel when you become when the object becomes you, in a way, rather than you, you know it. Oh, there's the clear light. Oh, OK, great. I'm going to sail into that. No, the, the clear light becomes you. 
and it sort of seems to come up like that mirror came up his arm. If you, any of you can remember that vivid, they're such geniuses, the Wachowski brothers, they're Buddhas. They're just <laughs> brother and sister, actually, now. One of them even had the guts to have a transgender operation. Larry became Lana. They're so great. I don't know them, but I want to. <laughs> and uh, that's a perfect thing if you go back and look at that part of that film. And uh, so you're telling this person, when this thing seems to be absorbing you, you say, this is me. This is my real deepest being embracing me. I'm embraced by this freedom, by this bliss, by this melting, this ecstasy. This Actually, I have a word that I invented recently in a political gathering to try to cheer up Ralph Nader and a few other angry people. Uh, I had this thing about having a digasm. <laughs> I apologize. I know it's really bad. Okay, so you just let go to it. In other words, you just have to let go. And you have to be ready to let go. You have to realize it's not the blob coming to eat you. It's not the devil. If you, you, know, if you think lurking outside, it's a, in a way, the nothingness is not that bad in that sense, in that... At least if you think that nothingness is getting you, then you're prepared to accept that you know, as a materialist, and at least you have a fantasy that it's going to be anesthetic. You're not going to feel pain. You might wriggle and writhe because you're used to holding on, this is me, but then you're sort of into nothing, and you're not afraid of nothing because you think it's nothing, so it won't bother you. But then you're never sure, and you've watched too many horror movies where Sigourney is going down the corridor in the spaceship and in this dark place, and an alien jumps out. You know? So you're scared, and we think that that darkness is filled with all kinds of devils and aliens. Here, this is Halloween, actually. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so we're brainwashed like that. We're t terrorized. The, our cultures terrorize, not just the Eastern cultures do, too. They scare people. We shouldn't be that. It's, uh, even beneath the darkness is the clear light. That's what you should be doing. I hope you did that at night. Did you do that? You remember to do that hear the yoga of sleep at Menla. So then, now this mirage you see, you know, then here's, then you read to the dying one. Actually, I added this because in the original, it just goes mirage, etc. You know, Tibetans do that because you know, they're having to carve this in wood to print it and they're bored and they write, etc. So I put, I filled in the etc. Now this mirage you see is the sign of earth dissolving in water. The smoke you see with your inner eye is the sign of water dissolving into fire. These fireflies are the sign of fire dissolving into wind. We did this right yesterday. This candle flame is the sign of wind dissolving into consciousness. This moonlit sky is the sign of consciousness dissolving into luminance. This sunlit sky is the sign of luminance dissolving into radiance. This dark sky is the sign of radiance dissolving into imminence. This pre-dawn twilight sky is the sign of imminence dissolving into clear light. So, so that's great. So, and you should learn those eight things, although it's not invariable. Someone will go straight to smoke. Someone, instead of fireflies, will feel hot sparks, have a thing of hot sparks more focused on the fire. Some will, you know, it'll be different, a little bit different. Or some might, it might normally we go very fast through it and don't notice any of it. So that's why it's very, very valuable. If you, the Dalai Lama used to say, he said six times a day, he has a yoga of six times a day. He visualizes his self as a mantra, like the letter Hung, actually. H-U-M-G. M-G, not N-G. M-G, Hung, like that. And he, he visualizes himself as a certain, has a certain shape. And then he, in eight stages, each part of the letter, which is sort of his soul letter, dissolves into the rest of it. So there's eight points of dissolution like that. And that's earth to water, water to fire, fire to wind, wind to consciousness, consciousness to luminance, luminance to radiance, radiance to imminence, imminence to clear light, transparency. And so he does that six times a day to get used to that, you know. And that's a really useful, valuable thing. Anyway, th then the key thing here, now he says, she says, now he's 
the first instruction in bold type here, he says to, the, to someone who's already a bit of an adept, a teacher, he says, venerable teacher, please act on your spiritual conception without wavering. That means spiritual conception means your bodhisattva vow, where you pledge to be love and compassion for all beings in all your future lives. And you to focus only on other beings and love them and be compassionate to them. And that's what you need at this point. You need this as you're melting down into a sort of the center of the heart chakra. The point, it actually is very interesting. You see, when you're conceived, they say, the genes of mother and father, which they imagine to be semen and blood, white and red. So the white and red seeds meet, right? In, in the womb of the mother. And then you come, and, and you, th you are having a dream experience, dreamlike experience in your subtle ghost-like body. And you see the mother and father. And then you kind of just, you just try, if you're going to be female, you, th you try to be the mother and just unite, have an orgasm with the father. If you're going to be male, you be the father and have a union with the mother and melt into the mother. And then what happens is you end up landing between the red and white seeds, the way that they, the Buddhist science understands it. And then your seed, your subtle body, mind, super subtle wind light on it, is blue, dark blue. Because red, white, and blue, so cute. French, Russian, and American. <laughs> and, and then it's sort of trapped in there. And therefore, the moonlit space that you see when you go back and unravel this in the point of death is where the white uh, seed opens, releasing the beginning to release the blue center. And then the, 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 the red light, the solar thing, is the blood, is the, is the red, connects to the ovum and the, the female you know, cr you know, fer fertile energy. And then that's when you see so brilliant so sunshine, you know, because, because women have all the power. That moonlight, a little reflecting thing. <laughs> the women have all the power in the Buddhist thing. Hindus, they try to like, you know, they are Shakti, but you know what, I'm Shiva or something, you know. They get a little crap. <laughs> and then when you see the dark lit, it's because you're, you're just go back into your blue place there. You know. And then... And then that blue place feels all naked without the red and white and look, wants to go look for another th place to be so that they will have a machinery of, of a boundary itself again, you know, wants that. But if, the, if that person in life has learned to boil down into the heart center, has learned to sort of simulate this experience and to let go of everything, has learned, uh, learned to allow themselves to melt, they have removed their emotional armoring, they're trapped nature of their neural system and their mental system, and is able to say, I am this vast light and space of, and one with all Buddhas and beings, then the, the I am, they, they feel secure enough that they will then notice beneath that blue dark, they will notice what is really the deepest energy of the blue and the red and the white, which is the, which is the indescribable, although the analogy is freed on twilight, is a diamond, transparent, glass-like diamond. That's the analogy, but it's indescribable. You can't, it's beyond duality of bright and dark. So even, even attempts to describe it have to always make the caveat that it's not going to work, this description. So then there's a nice thing. For, that's for the teacher. You just say, remember, you are, you are love and compassion. And this, that means that this clear light is love and compassion. Because why? If there's any suffering... Something inadequate, incomplete, or one thing pressing on another. This energy just enfolds it all in bliss. And it fulfills any lack of energy anywhere. It's because it's an infinite energy that can be drawn. Therefore, it is basically love, which is a total you know, energy of happiness, of fulfilling, of satisfying. That's what it, that vast thing is. So it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's no biggie it's not, to melt into bliss because you, you want bliss. Everyone loves it. Hey, noble one, now you have arrived, and here's the instruction for the more regular person. Now you have arrived at so-called death. So you should conduct yourself according to your conception of the spirit of enlightenment. 
that is your will to, to be love of all beings, to become a Buddha, to be love, your bodhisattva, and therefore to be whatever component of that you can, which is the bodhisattva deeds of body, speech, and mind. You should conceive your spirit of enlightenment thus. Alas, I have arrived at time of death. And it's alas because human body is a great thing, a great achievement in itself. So alas is, you know, we're not, that, we're not happy to give it up. We're, oh, my left knee. I'd love to give up my left knee. I would love it. I have arrived at it from soccer, from playing soccer. Oh, Steve there is like, that's OK. He's in clear light there. Don't worry. <laughs> alas, I have arrived at the time of death. From now, relying on this death, I will develop my spirit only by contemplating the conception of the spirit enlightenment of love and compassion. For the sake of the whole space full of beings, I must attain perfect Buddhahood. And this, I, should, I should clarify this space full of beings thing. We look out in space, and we see darkness, which we imagine sort of nothingness, although somebody says, well, sunlight comes through it, and uh, there's cosmic rays and whatever. Maybe there's something there, you know. But anyway, we think of it as nothingness. And, and then they see all these stars, which we think of as just burning fires, you know, like 10,000 degrees centigrade, 10 million, I don't know how hot. So it's totally inhospitable to life, in short. So we, and then we're here, like a little blue-green thing that we're wrecking busily uh, in quest of comfort. And, and we... And we think, oh, what do you mean space full of beings? There's just a few of us here on the planet, you know, like 9 billion, 7 billion, whatever it is. And we're like all oh, lonely and uh, well, whatever. Luckily, it will be nothing soon. So, so what does it mean, space full of beings? Th these people from ancient time, thousands of years ago, they look out and they see zillions of planets like this. They see one, like a great carpet. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, okay, and don't say that's impossible. Okay, here's a carpet. Your scientists will tell you that it is made up of atoms that have a tiny nucleus and tiny electrons there and mostly black, blank space. So similar to the model of the outer space. It's like that. But I see a very smooth carpet. I don't see holes in it. And it looks like a nice carpet. So there could be a vision that would pick up those places of minds. And they're not just material planes. There may be places in, the, in our cosmos that are not on solid Earth and so forth, but are pure energy fields, beings in floating in pure energy fields. And, and, and so there's a vision that sees all of them. And it sees space full of them also. Suffering ones, when they say space full, they're talking about the ones who are suffering. All our mothers, who've been our mothers, and I'm going to attain Buddhahood, which means I'm going, to be, I'm going to be this bliss that I'm melting into here, but I'm going, to ma I'm going to be one to engineer this bliss into forms that will help those space full of beings find this bliss themselves. That's what I'm going to do. That's what Bodhisattva wants to do. That's what it means to want to be Buddha. And especially you should think, now for the sake of all those beings, I will recognize the death clear light as the body of truth. That means it is, it is this invisible body of reality, of infinite reality. Within its experience, I will attain the supreme accomplishment of the great seal. Like, you know, a sealing wax. Actually, I have on my phone this California guy. He has a seal with a, <laughs> a, seal with a crown and a planet on his nose. It says the great seal. You know, like a seal, like, oh, 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 you know, the seal. <laughs> but the great seal means like a sealing wax. And what that means, the great seal, is you're embraced by the bliss field of the clear light of the void. In, that, in other words, it's like everything embraces you orgasmically. It's the orgasmic embrace of infinite reality, something like that. Everywhere, every cell, every atom, everything, not just, not just what Freud would call genitally organized sexuality. It is an infinite melting of yourself, and the seal is that you are sealed by this bliss void indivisible, bliss emptiness indivisible. So with, I will attain the supreme accomplishment of the great seal, and I will accomplish the purposes of all being. If I don't attain that, then in the time of the between, so the best time to attain it is when you're, you are 
melting. You are living in the body of death, in the body of death as truth, the body of death as deathlessness. That's where you're living. But if I don't attain that, that's what, they're always stepping down in the Book of the Dead, in the Book of Natural Liberation. Then in the time of the between, I will recognize it as the between. That is, I will lucidly between, like a lucid dream. I will realize that that between as the great sealed body of integration. I don't use integration in my call it communion. I'm sorry, Catholics, but that's the great body of communion. Same thing. And I will accomplish the purposes of all the infinite space full of beings by manifesting whatsoever is needed to tame whomsoever. To tame means to educate. To tame means to get rid of them being under the control of the wild ego habit that makes them feel crazy because they are this one little thing facing a vast universe. And therefore, they're frightened, and they're angry, and they're greedy, and they're completely deluded and depressed, and they, they just they realize they can't overcome this vast universe, and therefore, they lose to it. So tame them means to educate them that they are the vast universe, and they don't have to fight with the vast universe and lose the fight. Thus, never losing the willpower of that spiritual conception you should remember the experience of whatever instructions you have previously practiced. So then, then you go. Then he says to the, now right now the objective clear light dawns for you. Recognize it, please incorporate it with you. Then there's another great section here of this type. Hey, noble one, you named so and so. If you want, when you want to meditate on this yourself, you could think of someone you know who recently died, who you cared for, maybe who you were with at the time. It's never too late to talk to them, especially if Nina and Michael Newton are right. And everybody has multiple, everybody, everybody is too big. Everybody who has attained humanity, their, their soul, mind, body, being is too big to be incarnated in one little human brain body. And so even people who are already reborn somewhere, they're also still there as a, as a, a divine being in some way, an angelic force, uh, uh, something that's not incarnated in the flesh and blood bone. Although, although the main thing is to go into the flesh and bone, actually, the human form, the only reason that we all have a human form is love and compassion, actually. We wanted this body of flesh and to be, in order to touch other beings and be touched by them. When we were just meditation beings, it was we were just flitting around, and like we went up to give somebody a hug, and we like <laughs> hugged right to each other, you know, like, like that guy in the movie Ghosts. You know, Bruce Rubin, who wrote that, had read, studied this. No, uh, unfortunately for him, not my translation, but he did study it. <laughs> and now, now he has mine now. I came to see me, actually. He has mine now. But, you know, that, that all of the phenomena that are there about, you know, him trying to communicate to his wife, and he can't, that's totally there. And that's another proof of my former life, by the way. After I dropped out of my high school, I went to stay in the dorm room. For, I was kicked out, actually. I dropped out, and then I was kicked out when I tried to go back. And I was staying in the room of uh, uh, some upper-class guys who were already at Harvard. And I was in their room, and they had a TV in their room. And there was a session of the David Susskind show, which only probably very few of them will even remember what that could have been. And they were debating something really interesting to me of deep philosophy. And I was beside myself trying to get into the discussion. And I was saying, no, like something. And I was like really upset with one point of view and then the other. And I had a way of solving this problem. And I was like totally like that. And then suddenly I was so frustrated and emotional. And then Tom and, and Ted came and said, what's the matter? And I said, well, you know, they're not doing it right. And I was like that. And then I suddenly sat back and I said, oh, that's what it's like when you die. You want to say something to the people you care for and care about, and they can't hear you. And you go and shake them by the shoulder to pay attention to you, and they, they do not react, and they do not feel it. And I had not read this at that time. So that's a proof of former life right there. How would I know that? How could I imagine that? No Western person ever wrote that. Or nothing I ever read. No Greek, no Roman. Romans are all like the vomitorium. They would never think about it. So, so, okay. Hey, noble one, you named so-and-so, listen here. Now the pure, clear light of reality dawns for you. Recognize it. 
Hey, noble one, this your present conscious, natural, clear, void awareness, this presence in clear voidness without any objectivity of substance, sign, or color. Just this is the reality, the mother, Buddha all around goodness. So this is the ultimate context shift that I'm talking about for all of us to work on. You're surrounded by the mother, the cosmic mother, the poor Judeo-Christians, their male chauvinist transmitters of what was probably deep teachings they received from a deity, they received from mystics, they turned the mother into a ghost. You know, she is, meanwhile, infinite energy of completely loving embrace and nurture. And so whatever happens, it all hangs out, it all falls out, you drop dead, you lose consciousness. The, the bottom line is this loving embrace of this infinite translucent energy that is a, such a different context within which your life is taking place. It's, you know, maybe some people had a kind idea to withhold it sometimes because maybe people would become too complacent. And Tibetan Buddhists can't become too complacent, I think. Some Buddhists do. They just sit around like, yeah, but... It's like, you know, what is it, Allstate, is it? Which one of those insurance companies holds your house in these two hands? I never want them to see a, a tanka, an icon of the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara. They would abuse that in advertising, you know, <laughs> held in thousand hands, you know, the, the, your house, you know. Because So the Buddhists do, a, especially Mahayana Buddhists, but Theravada sort of have it in, in a suggested, hinting way. You're held and embraced in this wonderfully positive thing. It's a wonderful universe, actually. That was Buddha's discovery. His discovery was not suffering and misery. People were having plenty of that. They didn't need it discovered for them. What was the, the revolution that the Buddha did and why it's still happening on the planet is everything is fine. You know, Ray Charles, it's all right. Did he have a song like that? I think in the video of that song, like the George Washington Bridge is collapsing in an earthquake. So he's singing, it's all right, it's all right. This presence in clear voidness without any objectivity of substance, sign, or color. Just this is the reality, the mother, Buddha, all around goodness. You know, in a way, therefore, in near-death experience, the, the tunnel the tunnel phenomenon is very likely because these Americans or these modern people have been on the superhighway so much. They're going somewhere. They're actually meeting this clear light, but to them it's like they're getting somewhere. So they're zooming down because they want to get to a destination. They're so, like Wendell Berry, that I was thinking of his name the other day, Wendell Berry has one poem that I love about, never mind, the ocean is going to come and swallow you, the hurricane, the typhoon, birth, death, everything will be all right. Just keep on driving. <laughs> it's a, a poem to Americans, a little bit, a little bit teasing them or you know, abrading them. But he says, I know you think everything will be all right as long as you can keep on driving. So I think the tunnel is really meeting this clear light, but then you're making it, you know, I don't mean you personally, I mean, you are making me, you're making it like get to New York, you know, get to the, Get to the beach, you know, get somewhere, you know. And so it becomes a tunnel you shoot along. I really think so. I don't think itself is a tunnel. Although then some people think it's the, you're shooting down your central channel from your brain into toward your heart center. And then, that, then you don't want to go further down. <laughs> want to be, as you mentioned the other day, you want to be careful. You want to go back up. So that could be also that. But, and, uh, so this, just this, so that's the mother Buddha all around goodness, Samantha Bhadra, total goody-goody. That's the universe itself. And this, your conscious awareness, natural voidness, not your awareness voidness. In other words, not your object. The, the mother is your ob the objectivity voidness. The, your awareness is a subjectivity natural voidness, not succumbing to a false annihilative voidness, just your own conscious awareness, unceasing, bright, distinct, and vibrant, 
Just this awareness is the Father, Buddha all around goodness. Just this presence of the indivisibility of your awareness as naturally insubstantial voidness and the vibrant, bright presence of your conscious awareness. Just this is the Buddha body of truth, Father, Mother, Buddha, Father, Mother, God. Your awareness thus abides in this vast mass of light, of clarity, void, indivisible. You are free of birth or death. Just this is the Buddha changeless light. It is enough just to recognize this. Recognizing this, your own conscious awareness's purity, nature as the Buddha. Yourself beholding your own awareness. That is to dwell in the inner realization of all Buddhas. That is so nice. That's the death point between. And of course, ideally, if one was really fully prepared, if you'd been doing your practices and your studies, if you had encountered at any time, it doesn't matter what age, if you'd encountered someone to help you to embrace your selflessness, to learn to identify yourself as selflessness, then and to deepen that by focusing on that, not just by not thinking about anything, because that will not critically unravel the deeper structure, subliminal structure of you as the boundary itself. Just stopping thinking is only stopping the surface manifestation. To really go down in the deep unconscious, in the autonomic level, you have to like go in there with a careful scalpel of critical awareness, and you have to unravel it. And then you will be, this moment will be, the, it'll be a digasm. It will be the father mother meeting. It's totally great. <laughs> oh, never mind, that's a joke. So then, so then I divided this death between, you know, the first one, the, re the death between into two, which they don't really do, but I, I just added that. That's why I have it in italics, because I added it. I call it the out of body reality clear light. So first there is, the, there is the clear light that's instantaneously because actually, right now, and that's, that's, that's what tantric understanding of Buddha nature, right now, inside this red and white softball, <laughs> like, like a jewel case, you know, like a softball, but with one flap is red and one is white, in which the, in which the super subtle clear light mind and super subtle energy, subatomic and a subparticle energy, which is the body of the clear light mind, which is the same thing, but we, you know, we're used to thinking of two, but actually it's the same thing. It's just the one thing. It's right there. And that we all have that right now. But it's just, it's just blocked from our being subjective in that. It's blocked from our experiencing ourselves from that. And the death is the great moment where we open, we, we, we go there. And when we hit that, that's a Buddhahood. But our problem is we shoot past it. Because we can't imagine that, this, that everything is us. We can, though. You've been in love. You've all been in love. Head over heels. Gene Kelly, upside down, rain bombs falling everywhere, soaking wet. And you completely expand your sense of identification, and you and the beloved are one being. You just feel one with that being. And it doesn't have to be erotic. It can be like a child holding in your arm, mother holding child in arms. It's very close to that. Maybe erotic is the most powerful one, actually. But but the mother and child is very powerful. Father and child can be very powerful. And, and there are various versions like buddies in war, you know. The Japanese are really big on it. You know that story about the Japanese crew that were barred from international crew racing? After this, they almost beat the British crew in some river somewhere in, in, in England. And they just lost by like a, you know, inches. And afterwards, two members of the Japanese crew died. They had brain hemorrhages. Because they're so into, like, we're one organism with the other. You know? 
They just ignored the signals in their body to keep pulling, you know, to win. <laughs> they had Japanese have that, you know, because that because of long exposure to selflessness, actually, to the the atmosphere of the teaching of selflessness, the institutions of it, etc. Not that all of them understood it, but subliminally it, it infiltrated the culture, which it hasn't so much ours. Jesus did his best, and it did to some extent. But it was not technical in the same way. So then out of body reality, clear light. Hey, noble one. Yeah, out of body is you're sort of the the because when you hit the, your own clear light awareness, subtle body, super subtle body, super subtle clear light awareness, super subtle body. Because you are you get there from through a through a, a threshold of unconsciousness. And because you have not trained yourself to develop the level of cognitive tolerance of cognitive dissonance where you can be consciously unconscious, which is possible. They say, I don't claim to have achieved that, unfortunately. But it is possible. And that's the fourth state, actually, of the formless realm. And because we haven't done that, we then miss the clear light. But, because, but if we consciously hit the clear light, then we are beyond, it's not like we are some little point in somebody's heart center. We are like vast infinite. We skid all over the place. It's like you suddenly hit ice, and you're like you're, you're infinite. And, that, and it's beyond any ability to identify. And if you're not prepared for it to identify, this is my Buddha self, something like that, this vastness, this being everyone, you suddenly, you're suddenly feel like you lost yourself among everyone. You don't know, where am I? You're kind of like, where am I? What am I doing here? And why can't I do anything here? Because I'm everything that's here. And then you desperately claw and scratch to try to be someone in, the, in an environment. You can't be the whole environment. because you're not. Good. And you, that's what you become when you hit clear light. Because clear light is not anybody's possession. Clear light is not my clear light. It, it's only mine when the my is everybody. And identify like that. So that's why they say then inexpressible, you know, and shouldn't try, and you can't express it. But, but only negationally, that it, it's not like that. So then the outer body is where then someone is skidding around and they don't know what to do, you see. It's not that first second of hitting it, which is the death point between the in, in body. But outer body one is then, then you introduce them to people who will help you. So then you have to see. You're embraced by the thousand-armed being, by, by the goddess, by whatever it is. Hey, noble one, meditate on this, your archetype deity. That's a yidam, ishta devata, that means. Chosen deity. I call it, in honor of Jung, I call it archetype deity, which I think is not bad. Don't be distracted. Aim your intense willpower toward your archetype deity. Then this might be Jesus for someone from a Christian background. It might be Moses or some mystical Kabbalah thing for someone in Judaic background. It might be Kidder if you're a Muslim and you heard about Sufism or you are a Sufi. Um, it, it, it doesn't kind of help it, it to be Allah or some, something that's beyond, that sort of flattens you out. That's sort of too much like the clear light itself. So it's some kind of a manifestation. Meditate it as apparent but reality less like the moon in water. Don't meditate it as material. And then meditate on the Lord of great compassion. And I say here, this could be Jesus. It could be whoever you think is. For the Buddhists, this is Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Yin, you know, for the Chinese. And they actually had, you know, Sri Lanka had Mahayana and Vajrayana totally until the 10th century. Then there was some politics between one more sort of orthodox, we only want Theravada and we don't want them, and a monastery that was more normal in India and Sri Lanka at the time where they had the three vehicles, and they, and they had a political thing, two guys vying for the throne, two kings, not so much between the Buddhas, although they used the, the prejudiced mind of the Buddhas, and then they went and eradicated that, that uh, the, the Abhayagiri, what's it called? Abhayagiri. Yes, don't worry. He's not leaving in protest. He has to do something. He forewarned me, so I wouldn't collapse in a puddle <laughs> of insecurity by taking it personally. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. <laughs> and we're almost done anyway ourselves. No, we still have a ways to go. So 
So, so then this is when you need your ally, your mentor, your guru, your, your, um, your you know, some, some sort of notion, whatever you have of the most secure, the most, you know, the most soothing, the most, the being you have the greatest confidence in. And, you know, you may consciously have elaborated a certain world through yourself, but in your childhood you looked up to Jesus or you looked up to, to Moses or you looked up to Seneca or you looked up to I don't know who. In my case, I, I, when I get down into this kind of area, I have a tendency to hear, when I hear voices, I hear Walter Cronkite. I don't hear George Burns with his cigar. He's not the voice of God to me, although he played God in a few different things. But Walter Cronkite somehow, whenever a big statement happens to me that seems to come from the gods, it's in the voice of Walter. Well, that's the way it is. CBS News signing off. This is Walter Cronkite. And that's reality. And we used to have a few decent news. It wasn't all propaganda, Fox News, bunch of baloney like we're getting nowadays. Because we still had fairness doctrine, we still had rules of the FCC controlling monopolies in media, and we were not being brainwashed like we are nowadays, in those days. So Walter is up there. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, then, so that's it. And then that's when you need help, and then that talks about that. Then now, then you come to what I call the mild deity between, which is over there. And those are the mild deities, and you can find all the deities mentioned in the Book of the Dead there, because then it becomes culture specific. Once, you're, once you haven't been able to identify completely just melting into, blissfully melting into total everything, the absolute with everything in it, that means, you know, not just some blank space, but absolute with everything in it, which is all you, which is, must be a weird experience. But luckily, you can take it because you're total bliss energy. So you can take it because it's all seen to be you as bliss. If it wasn't you as bliss, it was you like normally where you are separate from things and looking for a, looking for a dessert, then, uh, then that would be awful. But it's all you. So then now you come to the, what's called the mild deity reality. You move into the reality between, past the death point between, and you both, both um, in body and out of body. And then each time, you know, you can see the... the the, in the Book of Natural Liberation, you can see the residue, you could say, or the traces of dualistic Buddhism for the ordinary person you know, who must think of the state of liberated bliss as something different from this world. They cannot imagine it as the actual nature of this world. And so that's, those traces of that dualistic Buddhism are left there, like saying, well, if you get liberated, then you don't have to be born. You know, it's constant refrain in the book of the natural liberation. So it's like they're still making a duality, therefore, that means, between a state of liberation and being born somewhere or living somewhere. So they're still catering to that idea that I said, where Buddha told certain people, and, you know, the foundation of the Buddha Dharma being the 18 different schools, of which nine of them were called, or eight of them, I think, were Theravada, and 10 of them were uh, Mahasangika, what it's called, which only exists now in China, but the monastic Buddhism, or individual vehicle Buddhism, as I call it. And the traces there are left, because the, that person who feels trapped in suffering, who's having a really hard time, they cannot imagine that, that they are so deceived in their way of seeing things that they're actually in bliss. So therefore, they have to think of a state of bliss as somewhere else. And they're not, and they're not pressed to sort of, at every moment, sort of press them down in non-duality, uh, because that would freak them out. They'd either become totally too complacent or paralyzed in a way with disbelief and totally discouraged and depressed. Because if that's what this guy says, he must be wrong, because this cannot be bliss, because I'm miserable. So then I don't even want to try to meditate or do anything, either on a good side or a bad side. A good side is I'm complacent. I don't have to do anything. I'm in bliss, and I can still be a slob and do nasty things. And you know, if you know, I think I'm suffering, but I'm not. You know, some psychotic way of solving it like that. Or I'll never get out of here. And this guy's crazy. He's telling me it's all bliss, and I know it's misery. So the dualistic thing is left there. Always, it's always there. It's like a foundation. It's like a sort of a total foundation until one reaches a level of strength and self-confidence where one can begin to imagine, well, 
if I can somehow flip my perception and I can critique and unravel this negative perception, then I will see all this as absolute bliss positive. Anyway, so he introduces, hey, noble one, listen unwavering with intense concentration. There are six kinds of between, the natural life between, the dream between, the contemplation between. Those three happen to us all the time. We're now in, all of us are here awakened, and we're in the natural life between. In the, we go in the dream between, between sleeping and waking. And the, and the contemplation between we go when we develop some skill in meditation and where when we deeply meditate, we, level, we achieve a level of concentration so great that in a way we disappear from body and mind. You know, there's the famous thing uh, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which echoes, interestingly, the experience of the great Japanese tantric master Kukai, Buddhist and Buddhist tantric Shingon founder Kukai, where he, he was uh, meditating in, uh, in his center that he went to in China, and one of his fellow monks fell asleep, and the master came, Chinese master who was initiated him and was teaching him and he was meditating, and, and scolded the guy next to him who had fallen asleep and said, you cast off body and mind. If you really are doing proper meditation and you had cast off body and mind, you would not, uh, you would not fall asleep because you wouldn't be in your body that would need to fall asleep. And this was a big satori moment. Actually, no, I'm sorry, why am I saying kuka? It's Dogen. This happened to Dogen. Zen guy, Zen guy. Sorry. Take it back. Dogen, great Japanese Zen master of the 14th century. And, and um, just as that happened in the Vimalakirti, Shariputra tells a story where he is a little reluctant to go see Vimalakirti because he was meditating in the forest at the foot of a tree one day in a garden. And Vimalakirti came and, and disturbed his meditation and said, Shariputra, this is not how you meditate. You're like, you, you, you're doing the wrong way of meditating. And Shariputra was like, what, what? Because he was the greatest meditator of the, of the Theravada, of Buddha's first uh, monastic disciple. And so then Vimalakirti says, you can only meditate when body and mind do not appear in the triple world. That is to say, you know, when you've melted your body-mind sense of self-definition as apart from the universe, triple world is realm of desire, realm of matter, pure matter, and realm of immaterial realm, or form and formless. So, so, uh, so that's, that's the contemplation between, right? Which are one of the three betweens we have in life. We're now in a between, between birth and death. When we fall asleep and wake up, we're in the dream between. When we go into deep meditation, where we, where body and mind no longer appearing anywhere in the tri in the tri tri triple in the triverse, not universe but triverse, then that's the contemplation between. Then the the ones that are, that we think of about quote unquote wrongly titled Book of the Dead, the death point between, the reality between, and the emergent existence between. Uh, emergence between that might be better just by itself. I don't like existence. Emergence between that might be good. I put that, but I was scared to put it alone. I put it with existence because that's so settled, you know, people by translators. <laughs> hey, noble one, three betweens will dawn for you because you're talking to a dead person, a, a corpse. But, but the, not the corpse because the person is already out of the corpse at this point. They are like hovering around like the, like. Uh, like uh, Patrick Swayze in the ghost movie. They're hovering around you, but they're nearby their body because they're kind of wondering who is that and why am I not in that body. How long is it take? What's that? How, what's the time frame for that? It, it could, it's different. It, it's, there's no fixed thing. It could be some time. Sometimes they say people stay in the pure, clear light for days. But the ordinary people, I think, they shoot through it like a tunnel, and then they're dealing with some kind of guide. You know, they meet some mentor or guide who maybe sends them back. Because the near-death near ones, of course, didn't die, so they're sent back. And, the, um, and then those who are not sent back, we don't have their testimony yet. <laughs> but we do hear, in a way, because these are ones who, this, this, all this description comes from people who did die but remained lucid in the dying. 
So the time of this is not set. So when you're dealing with a dying person or a dead person who did die, and you're like trying to be their guide and help, they've asked you, you've worked that out, you're working on that, then you can read it six months later, a year later, it doesn't matter. And actually, it's very valuable to do. A lot of people who are not Buddhists at all um, have written me testimonials that, oh, well, you know, I read this on the year anniversary of the death of my beloved this or that. And I had a very strong sense of connection when I read this to that person, and they seemed very happy, and it made me very happy. And of course, it could be just their fantasy, or it could be some real thing. I met someone just the other day uh, who was doing a, a special on me in the magazine of the Unity Church. And we had this terrible dance where we kept missing meeting each other. We spoke on the phone. And then she said, oh, I'm into future life now. Don't worry, Lemkin. Don't worry, I'm into it. And not just, you know, the one future life of the Christian, and therefore maybe past life, but I'm into it now. I said, well, why? She said, well, she said, my daddy sent me a sign, she said. I said, what? She says, yes. She says, well, she said, I don't tell many people, but I'm telling you. She felt okay because of my belief system, I guess. And she said, my daddy was a Navy soldier, and he was very proud of his unit. And he lived in Ohio, but in Albany, the Navy put up a big ship that was the kind of ship he served on. And then they have a different, and his name is on a plaque there because he was one of the people who served on this ship. And I told him before he died, I would go visit that, because he said he's that ship and the thing and my cap, and he was really into that memory. I said, I would go to that ship. I told him I would go. But then one thing I kept asking him as he was dying was, send me a sign, Daddy. I want to know you're going to be OK. And, I, and she hadn't read the Tibetan Book of Natural Liberation, she told me. And she, so then on the year anniversary of his death, she went to Albany to visit his ship. She told me. And then she said, I'm a details person. I'm highly organized. When I got to Albany at the hotel, I discovered I'd made the booking for the day before. But they let me transfer it this day. They, luckily, they had a room. So I went to, but then I was a little up to stress because I never make a mistake like that. So then I went up, and before having dinner, uh, I went and I took a nap. And then I lay down, and I was thinking about my father because I was going to go to the ship. And I lay down. And uh, I had my iPhone in my hand. And it, it was no, there was no calls or anything. And I turned the call. In case there was, I turned the volume off. And I was on the bed with me like this. And I fell asleep for 15, 20 minutes, she said. And when I, when I woke up, I, I sat up. And I, 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 I looked at my phone. And my phone was doing something I would have had to press three or four buttons for it to do. And I couldn't have done that because it was face down on the bed. And then it was playing music. And it was playing a song I never play. Heaven is here on earth. So then I said, Daddy, you sent me a sign. <laughs> and she, she was a little nervous after telling me the story. And I said, he sure did. Steve Jobs, get out of the way. He pressed all those buttons. <laughs> And he played you heaven is here on earth. Meaning, not only is he fine, but you should be fine. You're right there on earth, and it's heaven. Don't freak out. It's because daddy's not there. Daddy's there. No rush to join him. She was quite happy with that. I don't think she'll put that in the article. <laughs> oh. Hey, noble one. So those are the six kinds of between. OK? Uh, the existence between will dawn until yesterday in the death point between. The reality clear light dawn, but you did not recognize it, so you had to wander here. Now the reality between and the, the existence between will dawn for you. As I describe them, you must recognize them without fail. Hey, noble one, now you have arrived at what is called death. You are going from this world to the beyond. You are not alone. Actually, I don't think I'm, I want to wait, because actually Dale want, might want me to read this when he comes tonight. So I think I will, I will not do any more. Any, any question? Anybody have any questions? Okay. 
other than don't ask questions like of like what shall I do when I'm because Dale will answer those. But ask me any question about what we've talked about. What? Page is that? what? Oh, this is page one thirty and one thirty one. And you know what it is is the actual instructions I have in bold type. And then in this kind of type, in this mar same margin, I have the, the Tibetan text of the instructions of how what you how you read them to the person, you know. But these bold type ones are the ones you read to the departed one. And then in the narrow margin, in the smaller type, are my sort of notes. Because, you know, this kind of book, they didn't want like heavy footnotes on the bottom of the page. And also, I'm trying to make it where people who are not uh, Buddhists or not Tibetan Buddhists can use it. And I'm trying to say in my notes things like, well, now you could have Jesus appear here. Or you could have Mother Mary appear there. Or you could have this or that, you know, Krishna or whatever it is. Because I want to make it following Dalai Lama's thing, I want to make it useful to people without them having to adopt these kind of looking angel deities, you know, archetype deities. They might, these are for people, and even within Tibetan Buddhism, the, the particular Tibetan Book of the Dead that's very famous has to do with a specific mandala called the Guya Garba Mandala. And, uh, and it's very similar to like Guya Samaja Mandala or various other things, but it's, it is, it's distinctive in its own way. And there are even some of the orders don't even like this mandala that much for, for certain reasons, which are irrelevant reasons. It's a perfectly good mandala. And, uh, uh, and so, so there are other versions of it, but they're not popular that are used in other orders, you know, Sakya, Gelu, uh, Kargyu. This is Nyingma order, you know. But it's really great anyway. But I think I won't read all the way to this uh, until... Oh, no, I'll finish this one paragraph. Hey, noble one, now you have arrived at what is called death. You are going from this world to the beyond. You are not alone. It happens to everyone. You must not indulge in attachment and insistence on this life. Because one of the things that people do when they come out of the clear light and they're groping around to be somebody, they then they gravitate toward near where their body of the previous life was, the just, depart, just left behind life, and they kind of want to get back into it. They will somehow... And it's very frustrating because, of course, they can't. And it's already decomposing. Or something. It might have been three or four days. Sometimes four and a half days is something they sometimes say. But there's no rigid rule. Though you are attached and you insist, you have no power to stay. You will not avoid wandering in the life cycle. Do not lust. Do not cling. Be mindful of the three jewels. Three jewels are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. You know, Buddha is the teacher. Dharma is the reality taught and the teaching about that reality. Sangha is the community of those trying to live by that. But the great thing about three jewels for people who are not Buddha, and, be, and taking refuge in three jewels is how one becomes a Buddhist in a sort of formalistic way. But the good thing about it where people who are not Buddhist can still have a sense of refuge is they take refuge in the Dharma, which is the real refuge anyway for Buddhists. And the Dharma means reality. So I have my slogan that I really like, that what Buddhism really is is realism, because it's based on a vision of an enlightened person who said reality is safe. Reality is goodness. Reality is beauty. Reality is bliss. So if you take the more you have refuge in reality, the better off you are. Your ignorance is not bliss. Your ignorance is causing you suffering. That was, that's the, in a nutshell, that's Buddha's discovery and promulgation on the planet. So you can be, have a refuge in reality if you will change your context, your sense of context, and work, which takes work, and try to re-educate yourself to feel it's all right. And you can do that through Christianity. You can do that through Islam. After all, Islam, what does Islam mean? Salam alaikum, Islam. Islam means surrender. Surrender means give yourself to the clear light. What are you surrendering to? Well, they think clear light is... Some, some guy. But in a way, Allah, Allah in Arabic actually relates to la, which means no. It's like a negation. But that's a too deep. I won't get into that. But you could get into that with some Sufi mystic. You know, the sort of personalization thing. Like in their case, I guess it would be a guy with a beard on a camel with a sword. You know, uh, you know and, and not like, I don't know, never mind. And <laughs> Hey, noble child, whatever terrifying visions of the reality between may dawn upon you, 
you should not forget the following words. You must proceed remembering in your mind the meaning of these words. Therein lies the key of recognition. And now this is the part of the prayer. It says, hey, now when the reality, the Tibetans, say, well, the way they say hey is gema. The Sanskrit, the Indian people say ema. Now when the reality between dawns upon me, I will let go of the hallucinations of instinctive terror. Enter the recognition of all objects as my mind's own visions and understand this as the pattern of perception in the between. Come to this moment, arrived at this most critical cessation, I will not fear my own visions of deities mild and fierce. That's very good. And at, at, in the evening, I'm going to read something else about where they later on describe what, the, what, the, what your body is in the between, like what your, how your dream body is and how it works. OK? Any last questions? Before we go have the last supper? <laughs> no? Fine. Oh, good. She has a question. What is it? I can't hear. I'm sorry. What is that? I wonder if you can talk a little more about lucid dreaming. In oh, lucid dreaming? Context. Talk a little more about that? Well, I don't know. I'm not very good at that myself. And uh, although it's something I want to work on, and I do periodically try to work on it. But um, actually, Don Juan had good advice about it in the famous set of Castaneda novels. And he, for him, a, a very important thing to do was not only, I mean, Stephen Laberge is a great expert, and there are various people who are really good teachers of that. There's a book by a man named Stephen Laberge, who was the psychologist who researched that. And he'll then, he, he then goes, he teaches, he has seminars in Hawaii and all that. I haven't gotten him to come here, but I hope I will. And you know, you keep a journal and you go to sleep with the intention, I'm going to become conscious of myself dreaming in the dream without waking up. And you keep doing that. And then in the morning, whatever dream you had, even if you were conscious or not, you sort of write it down. If you can remember one, sometimes you won't, but usually you will if you start paying attention like that. Because you usually dream every night, actually, even though you don't, you only remember some vivid ones sometimes, and so you sort of put your focus on that. Which is, that's why I do that a little bit. And occasionally I have a little something, but I'm not good at it because I get distracted and too busy, and then I'm too exhausted when I fall asleep and I forget. But, and then I'm too busy when I jump up. But if you live more sanely than I do, you, you, when you go to sleep, you make a big intention. Now I'm going to be aware of myself in the dream that I'm dreaming. Then you go sleep, you have your dream. Then if you do the, if you do the clear light yoga of the men not sleeping, you, that's also a kind of intention. I'm gonna, my body will be left in this beautiful, blissful, clear light. I'm not gonna worry about it, and, I, and I'm gonna try to focus on the dream. You could combine those if you wanted. And, uh, and then you do that. But then Don Juan had a great tip, I thought, that I've never seen in a Tibetan book, but I thought it was very, very good when he was telling that annoying Carlos how not to be hung up. But he said, what you do in the dream is you set an intention. In the dream, I'm going to, you know, and I'm engaged in whatever you have visions you're having in the dream. I'm going to consciously look at my hands. I'm going to withdraw my attention from whatever is happening around, and I'm going to look at my hands and become conscious of myself as a body, a subtle body, maybe some whatever kind of matrix body in the dream, because I'm in the dream matrix, actually. It is a matrix body. But the way I will start becoming aware of the situation and what's, that I am awake and conscious in a dream is by looking at my, I'll look at my hands. And Carlos found that useful after much stubborn resisting and so on. And he then began to have some lucid dreams. And I think that's a fun thing. I really like that. Don Juan, the great yaki. Holy man, Don Juan, who I believe did exist, definitely. Uh, some people think he made him up, but I don't think so. I know his, you know, Carlos Castaneda, he had two failed PhD dissertations, and he succeeded his third PhD, and he got his PhD in anthropology. And each of the failed dissertations was a best-selling book. <laughs> <laughs> Tales of Power, and it was amazing, actually, kind of amazing experience. But I know his... Uh, I, I knew his, uh, not well, but I met his, um, 
thesis advisor. And he assured me Don Juan existed. Because he said Carlos could never have made that up on his own, which of course may be the attitude of the advisor, I don't know. But he was sure that he did exist. So, so that's a little bit about lucid dreaming. OK, any other things? Anybody? OK, take a break at ease. Talk amongst yourselves, <laughs> as they used to say on Saturday Night Live. OK, let's go have din din. Sorry, it's a little early, but that's enough. OK. And uh, please keep your, yeah, keep your sutra so you can have it for the next session. Hi, Dale. Hi. Oh, there's Dale. I thought Dale left. No, there's Dale. Great socks. This is from, they're from Vermont. Oh, good. They're darn tough. They're really good. Yeah, excellent, excellent. My son gave me some socks. They're called happy socks. Oh, cool. They're a little bit like that, but different yeah. colors. Yeah, these things are yeah. What's affordable. Up? I bought a Tonka. The, the oh, you want me to see that? Oh, that's it. Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. And, um, oh, how cool. That's a great Tonka. Isn't it? I like it. Yes. And I'm gonna I think that's a secret jambala, actually. A secret. Is yeah, it's Tonka? called a secret jambala, I think. I mean, I don't claim to be absolute. And he's so good. Well, he's definitely a wealth deity, of course. Right. And he's holding the jewel vomiting mongoose. Right. Right. And uh, and well, that's just desire. on. That's no. He said no, no, no. She's what? not desire. She's, she's poverty. She's poverty. He's standing on the incarnation of poverty, which means, of course, someone who's uh, who's dissatisfied in okay. a way. But because he's a wealth deity. Okay. And I think it's Jambala. Right. And uh, I don't think it's Vaishravana. The two most important ones are Vaishravana and Jambala. I think that's Jambala. And of course, that's an elixir of immortality, which is made from the blood of demons that he's holding in the skull cup in his right hand. And um, he's nice and, you know, like the Asian 